to tell you that we have a very exciting special guest today. It is another one of our featured teacher shows, and that is clearly the favorite of everyone who comes, because we all love to hear from the teachers that are using these tools in their classrooms. I am Peggy George, and I'm joining you today from Phoenix, Arizona, along with my co-moderator, Kim Case, who is joining us from San Antonio, Texas. Usually, Lorna Costantini is here with us, but today she is celebrating the Canadian Thanksgiving weekend with her family. So uh, we want to wish Lorna happy Thanksgiving and happy Thanksgiving to all of our Canadian friends. I also want to give a big shout out to Tammy Moore, who faithfully provides closed captioning every week for our shows. This is just a really special service that we are so happy to be able to provide, not only for our hearing impaired participants, but also for those whose first language may not be English. Just having the text along with the audio seems to really help. And the great news is that that's available in the recording, too. So if you're ever watching a recording and want to view the closed captioning, just turn it on and you'll be able to see it. Also, huge thanks to Lori Moffat, who helps us every week with co-moderating by working with Kim to capture capture your questions from the chat, and she and Kim will ask your questions for our special guest to answer at the end of their presentation. So welcome, Karen, and welcome to all of you. Do you want to let you know that our recordings are all posted in our archives, and we'll post that link a couple of times throughout the session today. And Every uh, show is recorded, and you will be able to access the recording, the chat log, and all of the links that we share. The Live Binder link will be there, as well as a listing of all the links. So we encourage you to use those and to go back and view earlier recordings if there's something you missed that you'd like to see. And this is one of the most fun parts of the show. We, every week, we like to find out where you're all joining us from. So on the left of your map there, you see a little starburst. I want you to double click on that starburst, and then click on the map where you're located. And you usually have to click twice on the map to actually place it. If it doesn't go exactly where you want it to go, just click and drag it and move it around. It is so much fun to see where all of you are joining us from. I see Shambles Guru moving his little icon around over there in Bangkok, Thailand. We have a guest from the UK and someone from South America people from Canada and all around the US. It is so great to have you with us. I hope that uh, uh, Thailand, yes. I hope that you're all finding that little tool. Uh, again, double click on that starburst just a little left of the uh, map and then double click wherever you're located. Terrific. Thank you so much. And you can also type that in the chat, because it's hard to tell uh, with the dot exactly where you're located. So type right in the chat and tell us where, where you're joining us from. I'd also like to let you know that we have a live binder that we prepare for every one of our shows. And uh, today's live binder is loaded with uh, resources that uh, Karen will be talking to us about. But throughout the show, many of you share your special links on the topic. And I go back into this live binder after the show is over and add all of your links to the live binder. So it becomes a fantastic resource resource for you to come back to later and really browse. Some, there are some videos in here, and you can check out in more detail the things that Karen is going to be sharing with us. 
we always like to ask a few poll questions of all of you just to get a little background so that our presenter has a bit of information about you. So our first poll question we'd like you to answer is what is your role in education? What are you doing? And right up there where you see the tiny A, the letter A, right to the right of that smiley icon there, you're going to click on that drop down and select your choice. You don't click on the slide, but you go over there to the drop down poll and select your choice. And if you're an E, since we can't list all the possibilities, please type it in the chat so we know uh, what your role is. You're doing great. Thank you. See, if you still haven't posted it yet, you may be having trouble finding that tool. But I'm going to move right on because I'm going to give as much time as we can to Karen. So I'm going to uh, publish the results of this survey. And let's see if I can get this out of the way here and show you. It looks like uh, about 27% of you are classroom teachers. 13% are either high school or, or college teachers. And we have just, a, uh, it looks like 2% who uh, are a distance learning instructor and then a bunch of others. So thank you so much. And I will clear that and take us now back to a yes-no polling and have a couple more questions for you. Next, we'd like to know, do you have a YouTube channel? Have you created one, either for yourself personally or for your use professionally with your class or with your colleagues? Give us a green check if that's a yes and a red X if that's a no. Great. This is really helpful for us to know. Again, I'm going to publish those results so Karen can see those and build on that in her presentation. So 25, 26% of you do not have a YouTube channel yet. You're going to want one after you hear Karen today. And 44% of you have a channel. And still some of you may be having trouble finding the, the place to do your voting, which is that polling option with the check mark up in the top left corner. Thank you. OK, next question. This always comes up. So we'd like to know, is YouTube blocked in your school? Give us a green check if it is blocked in your school, and a red X if it is not. There are so many schools that are still blocking it. And uh, for lots of reasons, but Karen is going to be talking about that today and has some excellent suggestions for you. So I'm going to publish those results, even though you may not have all finished voting. And it looks like 37% of you are so fortunate not to have it blocked. 25% of you do have it blocked. And again, we have about 15 of you that have not voted, which may mean you're not in a school setting and this question doesn't apply to you. And our final question on a different track, have you ever used QR codes for book reports? Give us a green check if it's yes and a red X if it's no. Oh, Karen, you have a treat for all of these people who are marking a red X. I'm going to quickly publish that. It looks like only one person in this group has had the opportunity to use QR codes for book reports. So this is very exciting. Thank you all for uh, sharing your information with us. And I'll just clear that out now. And we're going to move on because at this time, I am very excited to introduce to you Karen Mensing, who is one of my Arizona colleagues. Karen uh, lives in Phoenix, Arizona. And um, it's 
very ironic, but I met Karen through someone in my personal learning network in Australia, of all places. And from then on, I have been an enthusiastic follower of her. Karen um, is currently a self-contained gifted second grade teacher who is passionate about gifted education, educational technology, and 21st century learning. She is a Google certified teacher and trainer. And she is also a YouTube star teacher. Karen uh, uh, was able to attend both the Google Certified Teacher Academy and the first inaugural YouTube Teacher Studio uh, back in 2011 and was one of the very first YouTube star teachers. Also, in 2011, she was named uh, the Gifted and Talented Gifted Teacher of the Year. So I'm not going to say any more about her except to say, welcome, Karen. We are thrilled to have you here with us, sharing your experiences and your wonderful students. And I'm going to turn the mic over to you. Take it away. Well, good morning. Thank you for that very nice welcome. I really appreciate that. I'm really excited to be here and just talk about the things that I do in my classroom. Um, so to start out, um, I think you already kind of covered it, but I, I do teach second grade. It is a gifted second grade, but um, these would be things I'd be doing with any second grade students. I also teach a lot of enrichment classes and um, after school and weekend classes and things to all different ages. And I really feel like most of the projects I talk about could be used with second graders or above or even below. You know, I have taught some with K and 1 and while they're young, a lot of them are very tech savvy and they're all digital natives and they catch on quickly. But I do feel like most of the things I do, you could amp up and use with a middle schooler or possibly even a high schooler. So for Web, web 2.0 is kind of a vague term that we hear all the time and I kind of thought, was thinking about it this morning, like what exactly does that mean to me? And I guess when I think of Web 2.0, I think of interactive online technology and applications, not just a static website, something you or your students can actually engage in, um, including something like a blog, a wiki, social bookmarking, social media, things more along those lines, um, although certainly not limited to that. Um, in my classroom, why do I use them? That I could probably go on forever, but I mean the kids love it. I feel like if you introduce something, anything technologically based, the engagement level increases immediately. I mean, it completely changes the dynamic of the classroom. If you pass out a worksheet or a book, the kids are not terribly excited for the most part, as much as you might try to kind of get them excited. But I mean, they, they are smart kids. They know it's a worksheet. But if you put them online or give them an iPad app to use or something like that and they're suddenly doing things and they're creating and they're analyzing and they're using those higher level thinking skills, they are engaged and excited and passionate about what we're talking about, even if it's the same concept. So a couple tools, that, so school's been in session probably about a month and a half. Um, so I, I never feel like I've gotten as far as I wanted to yet, but so far this year with my second graders we've used Wordle. I have them all blogging on a site called KidBlog. Um, we have used QR codes just this week, and I'm going to talk about that because that was a really fun, exciting project. And they were audio QR codes. So if you've used QR codes, maybe you haven't used the audio feature, which just was so much fun. Um, we have used Poplet, BrainPop, um, YouTube, and we are a Google Apps for Education District. We're very lucky. And so we've used a lot of Google Docs and Google, Google Apps. So the docs, the presentations, even the little ones can use the calendar. They all email me. A lot of them email me their homework sometimes or they have a question at night about something and they shoot me an email through their school, their school approved Google Apps account, which is just great. So I'm going to move on a little. and talk a little bit about audio QR codes. So a QR code is, is not really new anymore. Um, it stands for quick response if you weren't sure. And they're those little, I'll show some examples in a minute, but they're these little square barcodes um, that you see everywhere at this point. I mean, if you look on the back of your 
cup from a fast food outlet, there's a QR code. I'm, I've seen them on ban stickers on bananas. Um, you see them on buildings, on movies, all kinds of things. So you see QR codes everywhere. And basically, it's, it's like a barcode, but it holds a lot more information. You can link to text, just text that you create. You can link to a video. So you could um, scan a QR card, and suddenly you're at a YouTube website. You can link to audio, which is what I'm going to show you. Or you could link right to a website. So you never quite know what you're going to get with a QR code, but it will always take you somewhere. Um, what's so great about them is they're really fast. They're very easy to create. They're free, and they are engaging. The kids love them, love them, love them. At the end of last year, last school year, I put together a um, technology night for the school, school-wide technology night, and it's a K-6 school. And I did a QR code scavenger hunt, a, a school-wide one. So anyone was welcome to participate. And the kids were going crazy. I and mean, kids as young as kindergarten were running around with their iPod touches, scanning the QR codes. And write, you know, they had to write down, everyone had a question, and finding the answers in the scavenger hunt to win a prize. And they were just all so engaged and so exciting, excited. It was just a lot of fun. So I think QR codes are a really fun, pretty simple way to really change, change a lesson or change your classroom. So audio QR codes, um, that's one where when you scan it, you just hear an audio message. It doesn't actually take you to a website or anything. You'll just hear kind of a little MP3. The site that I use this week is called croak.it. Croak it. Um, What's great about this site is it's free, which actually I think everything I talk about is free because I'm a teacher and I don't really have any money. So I, I really prefer free interactive tools. Um, so this is free. Another great thing is you don't have to create an account. And that is something that comes, that's a challenge, especially for um, elementary teachers, because online you generally have to be 13 or older to create an account for anything. So I can't tell my seven-year-olds to create an account if I don't have their parents' explicit permission. But this, we don't need an account. You don't need to enter any personal information. You just go to the site and start, which is fantastic. And it's really easy. You go to croak.it, and you push the button. And I think I'm going to try to bring you to the site. So Peggy, you can let me know if I'm not doing this correctly. Can we see, oops, what about this? Looks good, Karen. I can see it in the web door. Oh, OK, now I can. Okay, sorry. Yeah. It may be slow. Long long OK, long sorry about that. Yeah. It might be. OK, so this is what the site looks like, exactly like the screenshot that I took, basically. Um, and you just push to croak, like it says. You only, and the one limitation of the site is you only can um, croak, or, you know, speak for 30 seconds, which really, though, in many ways is fine. I mean, much more than 30 seconds can sometimes be a lot. So you just push, you start speaking, it records it. You can use this on a, on an, on a computer, on an iPad or an iPod. They have a free free app, and it's a free website. So you stop, and mine is just going really slow. But in, it pretty quickly, like when I did this this week with my class, it instantly created a little um, link at the bottom, which this is not doing. But I feel confident if you try it, it will work, um, because I use it a lot. And then we took that link and we created a QR code from it. So from right from here, you can just play it back. You can post it. I mean, they give you a lot of options of what you want to do with it. What I wanted to do is create a QR code. So back to back to this. So we went to we went to Kroger. Everybody did their message. It looked like just like this. Um, uh, Karen, excuse me. Your audio is going a little bit fuzzy for for me right now. Maybe you could turn your mic off and back on. It could have something might have happened when you clicked on the croquet button. Okay, okay. I guess I guess it is sounding any sound clearer. Uh, no, it's still just really garbled. Let me try. Let me try.
any better than weather now? Uh, no, not yet. That's great. I was going to suggest that Karen ran audio setup with it again. Something may have uh, changed her mic when she clicked on the croquet uh, button, and uh, that could have affected her. So she'll be right back with us. But uh, this is an exciting new tool for me, and I hope that it is for you too, because I didn't know that you could do that. So you'll want to check that out online to find out where to um, get that app. You can use it online or on your mobile device from what I learned in my short exploration. Remember, all these links are in our live binder today, so uh, you can explore those more later. Okay, Karen, are you back? Yes, I reset everything. Is it sounding any clearer? Woo That's perfect. Thank you. Okay, maybe I'll stay away because this is what last night when we were practicing. I feel like when I strayed out to another site, that's when I ran into audio problems as well. So I well, went right up against the mountain preserve, and I don't always have the best <laughs> internet connection at home, unfortunately. You're doing great, but the thing to remember is use application sharing if you're going to go into something that you want us to follow you and see your cursor and that sort of thing. But use web tour like on your blog if you want us to scroll down and see something on your blog. Okay? Got it. Thank you. Okay. So that's Croquet. Very, I mean, it's really very quick and easy to learn if you go later and just try it out. And it's Croquet. I keep saying Croquet.com, but that's not it. It's, there's no .com. It's just Croquet. Very quick, very easy. My seven-year-old students were able to use it um, with you know almost instantly without any problems or questions. So you get a link at the bottom after you record. You do your recording, and I let them practice a couple times, and then we went to a QR code generator. There are probably thousands of QR code generators out there. This is the one I prefer, um, but maybe you'll find one that you like better. Just one thing to always keep in mind is there's really no need to pay for QR codes. You will go to sites where they're going to say, oh yeah, we'll make it for you for only a dollar a code or something. I have never once paid for a QR code, and I've never had any problems with them. So I would not pay, because there are just so many freebies out there that I don't think it's necessary. So this is my favorite QR code um, site. I use the Generate Free, where you don't even have to make a, an account. You don't have to create an account. You don't have to do any of that, which again is another nice thing for kids that are that are young. So you can create an account, which is all, you know another good feature where if you want to save things. But if you're just looking for, okay, everybody created a QR code for their book report. We want to print them and put them on their poster in the hallway so people can scan them. They don't need to create an account and all that. So you just paste in. I pasted here in, or when we did it this week, I pasted in the Croquet code. It instantly creates the QR code. And I showed them how to save it. We saved the URL, which I'm trying to think. On a, on a Mac anyway, it's control right click and you get an option to copy the URL. So I don't even ever have to save the image. I, I'm just saving the code. And we paste it right into a Google Doc. So it looks like this. And it's the same thing. You go to Insert, Image, and then you do it by URL. You just paste that code in and it pops up right away. So I'm not cluttering up a desktop. I'm not, you know, at the end when I have 20 QR codes that all kind of look alike. I'm not so confused. We just paste it instantly. I had them write their name and they got to pick a fancy font below it so we know whose was whose and we printed them out. So it was pretty quick and easy. And then we tested them before we did anything else. We tested them again. There are hundreds, probably thousands of QR code readers. And this is the one I prefer, but uh, there's lots of them. This is a free one. It's very fast. It's very easy. I've never had any problems with it. Um, it's called Enigma. And it's, so we open up our, we, I had them open up an Enigma app. They scanned it just to test it. They all worked fine. They were all really excited to hear their voices coming out of a QR code. And then 
we attached them to these book reports that they did this week. Everyone had to do a Beverly Cleary book report, and one of the kids suggested we put up a sign that kind of explained in case someone wasn't familiar with QR codes. And they all printed their code with their fancy fonts and put them on colorful paper like this. And then some of them put them right on their poster. They did the poster for homework. And we have them all hanging in the hallway like this. And it's pretty neat. They're all different. Um, it's just fun. It's fun when parents come in and they see that we've kind of enhanced it. Um, people like scanning things, especially kids, I think. You know, um, even, gosh, probably third and fourth graders mostly have phones at this point. So they just pull their phone right out of their pocket and scan it. And I see someone's asking, what did it link to? I mean, this was kind of an introduction to QR code. So they'd done a whole report on their own where they had to do a presentation in class and everything. Um, the QR code was kind of a brief summary. It had to be less than 30 seconds. So like this one just said, hi, my name is Noah. Um, I read Dear Mr. Henshaw by Beverly Cleary for my report. I thought it was a good book because I really liked the main character, and I think you should read this book. So they were just really brief, brief little um, summaries. But it was really fun and really exciting to insert that piece of 21st century learning. Um, so that kind of sums it up. I mean, I do think with these QR codes, you could do it with anything. It wouldn't have to be a book report. We did something similar last March with we everybody did a report on Ireland or St. Patrick's Day in some way, and they did a text QR code. So they wrote a few sentences and put it next to, they all made um, pots of gold. So they put a QR code next to that. And so you would scan it, and it would say, you know, did you know this is the capital of Ireland? or in Ireland, this happens every year or something, so it was just little facts, and that was neat too. But I thought the audio is a just kind of a fun facet to interject into the QR codes, and the kids really had a good time. Karen, there are a couple of questions that I'm going to jump in with right now, since it applies specifically sure. to Crocod and the audio. They're wondering, is the link to an audio report on that QR code? Um, and then uh, Sarah wondered, when they link to Crocod, does the audio play right away, or is there another step? Um, when they, so when they scan these codes, which actually you could probably, if you have a QR code reader, you could probably scan them at your computer if you wanted. It, in, it basically just instantly brings you to the link and it plays their voice. So if I scanned this, I would hear, hi, my name is Tristan and I read Ralph S. Mouse for my book report. It was just a little brief summary that they did. Um, what was the second part of that question? I'm sorry. That covered it, I think. Thanks. OK. OK, yeah. So just free, easy, and a lot of fun. And really, I, I mean, this was kind of something I, I went to a training last week. And this was one of the things that I learned. And I thought, oh, I bet the kids would really like that. So I tried it. And they loved it, loved it, loved it. And that was with me not even really giving it a lot of thought. Like, oh, they happen to do these book reports. How could we kind of spice them up a little and make them a little more 21st century? So I just, I really see a lot of possibilities for this, which I think is going to be a lot of fun. And someone's asking if grade two students have phones. Some of them do, believe it or not. I mean, in the classroom, I don't let them use a phone. Um, but. I know some of them have them, and they keep them off in their backpacks. We, I'm pretty lucky. I've written a lot of grants and things to get a lot of technology, and we have some, we have some iPads we share with some other classes, and we have some iPod Touches we share with some other classes. And sometimes I just use my own and show them as a demo. They, don't, they love to all do it themselves, but sometimes if we're kind of in a hurry or I'm just showing something quick, I'll just pull out my own iPad and show them. And you still get that wow effect of like, whoa, I can't believe this which is nice. All right, so the next part of what I wanted to talk to um, is YouTube in the classroom. And I saw it seems like most of you, I mean, there were some that still had it blocked, but most of you didn't, which is so great because so many districts still block it like crazy and just say things like, oh, you can just use SchoolTube or TeacherTube, which those are fine sites, absolutely, but they're just not as vast as YouTube. I think I feel like YouTube has everything, where those are very, very limited. 
um, YouTube is working very hard to make it safer, make it more school appropriate, um, and make it more of a you know a professional learning environment for you and your students. There are a bunch of YouTubes right now, and I'm going to talk really briefly about all of them because if it is blocked in your school, there is a way around it with one of them, and I'll explain that. Um, YouTube edu or youtube.com slash edu, if you go there, it's a subsection of YouTube, and it's a lot of really high quality content, mostly from colleges and universities. You can find lectures, um, guest speakers, and uh, things more along those lines. I don't use this one very much with second graders because they're little, um, but it is very interesting, and it's a great way for teachers to learn about things. And YouTube, like, like everything I think I'm talking about, it's free, which is nice. Um, YouTube.com slash schools, this is the one that if it is blocked in your district I rec and you're not wanting it to be, I recommend that you go here. Um, it's a site that you have to sign up for it for free, and it basically creates a special YouTube account for your school or district that lets you access thousands of YouTube videos in a very controlled environment. So you're not going to see um, all the ads. You're not going to see all the suggested videos. You're not going to see all the things that schools generally don't want you to see, which is the reason why it's blocked. But you do have to sign up for it and kind of go through a process. Like I said, it's not. there's no cost to it, nothing like that. Um, you just have to kind of work with them to, to get it so you're going to be able to see what you want to see and not what you don't want to see. Um, I haven't used this, actually, because it isn't blocked in my district. So if it's not blocked in your district, there's no need to go to YouTube for schools because you already have everything you need. But if it is blocked, I strongly recommend going to this site because um, it basically gets, lets you have all the good things of YouTube without all the things that people are so concerned about. Um, the final new YouTube is YouTube.com slash teachers, which you could go to at home. Um, for for ideas because there's a lot of cool ways of showing how to use YouTube in the classroom. There are playlists for lessons. That, um, some of them tie to Common Core standards, and it just gives teachers a lot of really good teaching ideas. And what's funny is I could see on the chat on the side people saying, "Oh yeah, it's blocked," but and it's just so funny how you know they they block these things and everybody does end up figuring out ways to get around them. I, I have a friend who teaches second grade in Massachusetts and practically everything is blocked at her school and she will pull up a, a YouTube video on her phone, she puts it under the document camera in her classroom and shows it that way and it just, I mean and of course she's showing appropriate things that you know second graders should see but it's just really funny that the school is blocking it but she's finding ways around it because she really wants her kids to be exposed to some of the incredible content out there. So like I said, if it is blocked in your school or district, I really strongly recommend just exploring youtube.com slash schools because it's, it's a pretty, pretty great option. And it does kind of give you a, a very legal way, you know, legal within your district to get around um, what they're trying to prohibit. Um, at YouTube.com for teachers, or really you can do this in, um, well actually no, in YouTube.com for teachers, things are organized by subject area, which I love, and especially because that's not blocked in my district. So you can go in, you know, I might say, I, I need a math lesson. We're talking about um, mean, median, and mode, and I need to find one. So I go in, it has it organized by subject, and the, even further than that, the more, the deeper you get, it's also organized by grade level, sometimes by common core standard, and it just really narrows it down. So I don't have to waste a lot of time. I mean, I do screen all the videos that I show my kids because I just don't want anything to slip through, and they are so young at just age seven, but this really helps me with that screening process. But I don't feel like I need to watch 20 math videos before I find the one, the, the one two-minute clip that's going to work. This. I feel like these kind of playlists are already pre-screened, so usually they're fine. I mean, they're certainly all safe. I always just want to make sure that they're, con you know, they're not speaking way over their heads or something like that. Um, student channels. So, like I said, on the internet, everybody really needs to be 13 or older to get any account for anything. That is just the rule of the internet. But if you are a Google Apps for Education district, which more and more districts are going to. 
all of the kids are, have accounts, right? They all have YouTube or Google accounts, right? Like Google and YouTube are the same company, and everything meshes, which is really nice. If they already have those accounts, then you can get, they can all get their own YouTube account. I send home a separate permission slip, and here's an example if you want to look at one later. Just to clear it with the parents, I just feel like some people still have this feeling of YouTube is evil and I don't want my kids to see it and there's all these terrible things on it, which I feel like there's terrible things anywhere on the internet if you look for it, of course, but there are just so many great things. Of course, you know, you need to monitor and of course you need to talk about cyber safety and being appropriate on the internet, obviously. But I do think it's just such a valuable tool. There's so much they can do with it, and there's so much a teacher can do with it as well that I just think it's too valuable to pass up. So if you are a Google Apps for Education district, you could get your kids in with accounts right away because it already syncs to their Google Apps account, which is nice. Um, here is an example of what it looks like when you make playlists. So I created, so you can create your own, you can make them private, you can make them public, um, you can organize them, you can share them, you can do whatever you want, and it just makes it really nice when you're trying to find something that you know exactly where it is. Another nice feature of this is if you say you have a parent night or something and you want to show um, a bunch of videos instead of like showing one and five minutes it's over and you need to get it again, show another one, this will loop them. So I can line up like this Apple Store field trip. It's 13 videos, so if I play the playlist, it will play them all consecutively, which is very, it's a really nice feature. It just is, causes less interruption. To create a playlist, it's very easy. You log into your channel, you find the video you, that you want, you click Add to, and you create a new playlist, or you add it to your existing one. So if, if you know, it's your first one of that, you would create one. If you've already got one going on, then you just add right to it, and it's that easy. And then there's a um, setting that lets you make it public or private. Mine are all public. Everything I do on my YouTube channel, I keep G-rated because I, I want, you know, I, I'm teaching second grade, and if kids come across it, I certainly want it to be appropriate to them. But if for some reason there was something you were doing more personal that you didn't want kids to see, um, you can lock it, and it's, it's really easy. It's just a click. One of the coolest newer features of YouTube is that they now have an online video editor. So mostly for my videos, or at least in the past, I've been using iMovie, which I love, but it's very expensive. You know, it's only Mac-based, and it's not cloud-based. You know, it's, it's, if I do it on this computer, I really have to stay on that computer because the files are enormous and they're very hard to move around. But this YouTube.com slash editor it's cloud-based, so if I started at school and I come home on another another computer, it's all right there. Everything is saved. And well, it's not iMovie yet. It has a lot of the same features, and it's free, which is so exciting. Um, a little out of order here. When you go into it, you've got these are what some of the icons look like. You can add transitions. You can put text over what you're doing, you can add audio, you can add your own audio, or you can add, they give you some audio too, that, which what's nice about theirs is it's definitely copyright free, so you know if you post it, you're, you're, in, you're fine, you're safe to post it. They've got Creative Commons videos, but it's the same thing, they're copyright free, you can take them and use them and add them to your videos for no cost, and it just only enhances them. And you can um, kind of splice multiple videos together. So say I took five clips of kids doing something, you can upload them all, and then in this My Videos part, you can add, you know, you can add your transitions and add them all together, which is really nice. Um, if you go, well, you know, if you just look up the editing software, I'm not going to show you this because I don't want my audio to get all mixed up again, but there's a lot of little clips on YouTube that kind of explain the editing software and just give you like brief overviews, but it's really cool. I mean, they are adding more things every day and just even in the snapshot you can see, you know, it lets you change to sepia or black and white or make it really fun and there's just a lot of really fun stuff you can do with it if you're into posting videos or having students post videos, which is really nice. Um, I kind of already covered this. 
video setting options. This is a huge one because um, it, it's it's just so important. I think this is where people's worries come in. I try to make a lot of little videos of my class and of my class, and I post it to my blog or I tweet them or, or other things. Um, people are always concerned about privacy. For some reason, I always hear people talking about kidnapping as a big worry, and I mean, obviously that is a, a, obviously that's a terrible thing, and you know, I'm not making light of it by any means. Um, but I do think if you're safe, that kind of thing isn't really a concern. You know, I don't think if I'm showing a little Twitter chat of my second graders and I'm not giving any personal information about them, I don't know that it's going to lead to kidnapping. And sometimes I try to talk to parents about that and really try to get to the bottom of what their fears are. Because unless there's a very bizarre custody situation or something, I think kids are all over the internet. And whether we like it or not, it's kind of out of our control. Everybody's got a phone in their pocket. And you know, a fifth grader on the playground can take a picture and post it on the internet, and it's there instantly. So I think the more um, safe and comfortable we get with it, the better we are. But there are a lot of different things you can do to keep it safer. Um, one thing right away is I, I always allow my comments with approval only because there are some mean people out there that are going to say, wow, that kid looks dumb or you know, just something that's not, that I don't want anyone to see, that it's just not appropriate. So you can allow them automatically. Um, you cannot allow them at all, which is another option. I like to allow them with approval because that way if someone leaves a comment like, wow, this looks like a lot of fun, or you know, my class and I watched this video and we had a great time. That kind of comment I don't mind posting at all, but it sends me a message first and I get to moderate that yes, I want to play this or no, I don't. So that's a great option. And I always change that right away because I would never want someone's feelings to get hurt by someone thoughtless for just posting something that's not appropriate. Um, ratings is another thing. I usually just turn off the ratings altogether because I don't want the kids to feel bad. They're only seven. So if you know the video, I think it's out of five stars, if it only gets two ratings or something, I don't want them to take it personally when it, it may just be someone that thought it was funny to click two or maybe even click to the wrong button or something. So I usually just turn off the ratings. I don't really see any reason for them from what I'm doing anyway. The levels of privacy, this is the really big one. It's really easy. You just go into the privacy settings, and you can either completely lock it down and make it private, or, and so if you show it to someone, they can see it. You can make it unlisted, which means if you send, say I send my, the parents in my class the link, they can all see it, but no one can ever search for it. So if you're searching for elementary Twitter chats or something, and I've made that one unlisted, um, no one will ever find that. You'll only be able to view it if you have the link. However, if I send that to my, all the parents in my class and they post it on their website or they send it to grandma or grandpa, they will be able to see it too. So it's not just the people I send it to. But I mean, generally that's good. If I'm sending it to parents and they're sending it to grandma, that's fine. But if, for people that really do have strong privacy concerns, um, it is just something to know that anyone with the link can view it. And of course, the last option is public, which means anyone can find it and view. That, and I have to say that is what I do. I'm very lucky that all the students in my class have permission to be online. Um, the parents are very open to it. They enjoy the videos. And I'm, I'm of course, very careful. I don't ever use their names. Um, I don't ever do anything in advance. Like we'll, we will make these little kind of promos for upcoming school events or PTO events, but I won't say, you know, make a video saying my class will be at the Apple Store tomorrow at noon, so everybody knows where we are. You know, and I do really work hard to make sure it's safe and appropriate for kids. So they are public. Anyone can find them. Anyone can view them. I do have all those other, you know, the the ratings turned off and the comments moderated. So that way it stays safe. If a parent were to ever ask me to take something down, I would. Um, but I really work hard to make them appropriate because I, I want it to be a positive experience for everyone. And plus, I, I feel like I put so much time into the editing and all that. Um, I don't want to have to take it down. <laughs> you know, after I, I spend hours sometimes creating a whole video, I don't want to have to then yank it down. Um, another great feature of YouTube I find um, as a teacher is it lets me archive my work. Last year is the first year I really made a ton of videos, and it's been nice this year that I look back and I see what I did. 
it's, it's kind of the same as a blog. Um, the more I've gotten into blogging, I think, oh, what did we do last year for, you know, Johnny Appleseed? And I look up and I say, oh, that's right, we did a reader's theater and we made a, um, an interactive timeline or something because I've got it all there. So it's really nice. And so, with some of these things, I won't make the same video twice, um, but I'll show my class what we did last year. So if we um, did a science experiment, I might show them you know, this is what my class last year did, or even after the fact, like th that was your experience, this is how it went last year. And so that's kind of an interesting um, comparison. I also have the kids make little lessons sometimes. I mean, we've made them on um, parts of speech, we've made them on homonyms, um, I've had them make some technology ones, and so it's like a little mini lesson. So earlier this year we were talking about homonyms and homophones and homographs, and I pulled up this little two or three minute video clip my class from last year had made explaining the differences and giving some examples, and it was really fun. I mean, it was nice for me because it was kind of like a little pre-made lesson, and the kids loved it because they're like, oh, I know her, she's in my brownie troop, or that's my brother's friend, or I, I sit next to that kid at lunch, and it was just very exciting. Um, another thing you can do to get things on YouTube is to use, and I think I heard someone mention Camtasia earlier, but both of these are great. They're both free screencasting programs where you can actually record what you're doing on your screen. So if you're um, like a keynote or you're just navigating a website, because that's sometimes one thing that I like to record if I'm showing how showing someone how to get to Google Docs or something, I might just do a little screencast of it and you can upload it to YouTube and then you've got your own little mini lesson and you can add audio recording over it if you want or text over it or just show show them what you're doing. And I think that was about all I had to share this morning. I feel like I've maybe even gone over the time a little bit. so. Feel free to contact me with any questions or concerns, and I just I do always like to tell people, um, you know, sometimes when I'm doing trainings or things, right away I just hear teachers saying, oh no, I only teach fifth grade, I could never do this with my class, you know, I could never have fifth graders blogging or any of this, and I do it with second grade, I just, I feel like if you put it out there, you can do it. I mean, not every lesson will be a home run, it, they're not all going to be they're not all going to work, um, but if you don't try, it, you're never going to know. And I'm telling you, it's just amazing when you put it out to these little seven-year-olds, you know, some of them very tech savvy, some of them not, they do it. And they're so excited about it that they, they want to learn it. But even, you know, when I introduce um, new things, like Poplet, for example, which I didn't talk about at all, but Poplet.com, it's a great site. And it's fun and it's great for any ages. You know, I remember the first time I, I taught it, quote unquote, I didn't know much about it. I think a friend of mine had shared it with me <clears throat> a day or two prior and I thought, oh, the kids would like this. And they were asking me tons of questions and I didn't have the answers and I kept saying, well, why don't you try it? And, and next thing I knew, most of the kids had mastered it and were like, oh, look, Miss Mincing, we can add a video here. Or, look, I figured out how to change the fonts. And it was just incredible that they had so quickly taught themselves and surpassed me and were making these amazing presentations. It's just very, very natural to them. Um, so I just urge anyone to give it a shot. Start slow if you want. It's, I know people feel like it's really scary, but really once you do it and the kids are so excited and they're so engaged, I think it, it, it's really worth it. Definitely, and they'll definitely help each other. And I think this has been, you know, a great motivator and encourager. Um, for us to uh, give it a try. And it's poplet.com. It's P-O-P-P.com, I believe it is. Um, P, I think it's P-O-P-P-L-E-T.com. L-E-T.com. Okay, and you can yeah, change the like, link in the chat. Yeah. And, uh, and you can um, change the face of the, the – it's like a puppet. Um, that it pops around and hops around and stuff, and you can change the um, the face of the the little puppets and stuff like that, and make them say uh, and move them around the background and stuff like that. Um, I took down a few questions. Um, somebody was asking if you um, have to have a Google for Education account in order to use the YouTube editor. No, that is, that's 
free and open to anyone with any Google account, which uh, Google accounts are free. So if you do, you know, if you're just doing it for your own use, no, it's it doesn't have to be a Google Apps for Education account. Okay, and with the Google Apps domain account, do you have to worry about security for the kids? And is it kept within the Google domain for your district? Um, you know, I always worry about security because there are always things that can slip through. Uh, what's nice about Google Apps for Education, or you'll see it sometimes written as G-A-F-E. If you see that, that's what they're talking about. What's nice about those is the district does have a lot of control. They can turn off certain features. However, it is done at a district level. So I work at a giant district district of 34,000 students, so if I decide I don't want my students using docs or whatever, I can't make that decision. Right. The head IT guy would have to make that decision. Right. Uh, but there is some control, and he is re really good with taking input from us, and it's mostly about unblocking things. You know, rarely, I, I don't know, I just like the kids into everything, and of course I am instilling cyber safety and screening things, and we talk about, you know, you might see something inappropriate, and we talk about that, and what should you do, and what should you think, but I would rather have it open, because otherwise then it's just so frustrating if you're really trying to do something cool, and you're just getting blocked at every avenue. And did you mention where the, um, how you could get involved with the YouTube Super Teacher training or program? Um, I did not. Let me look up the site for that. Because I know there was a lot of interest in um, how one could get involved and explore that opportunity. Yes, definitely. It is, <clears throat> it's only offered once or twice a year. Um, so I would get on Google's, the Google and Education mailing list, and I think if you go to google.com slash edu, it, you kind of, I'm trying to find the exact site, so Google and does they YouTube? will start just posting, Google does YouTube as well, correct? Oh, okay. Yeah, it's the same, it's the same company, they're the same. Oh, so, oh. Um, interesting. It would, kind of, yeah, I know it's kind of surprising to a lot of people. Yeah, it's, they're in fact so the first largest search oh. engine in the world is Google, and the second largest search engine in the world is actually YouTube. That's right. Believe it or not, because people go on just searching for lessons on things. Thank you, sir. Um, so right, that's what someone posted it. So if you go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh no, that's okay. So if you subscribe to those or just check back to them often, you'll see the opportunities when they come up. Um, and generally, so these Google trainings that they have, they just had one in New York this past week. Um, they're not very frequent, but you, and you have to apply. And um, so when I did, you know, you have to fill out a lot of information about yourself and kind of answer some essay questions about how you use or aspire to use technology in education. And then kind of the big thing is you have to create a one minute video. And the theme changes every time, but it's always similar. Mine, the one I went to, it was um, or motivation and inspiration using technology and education. So, and it has to be a minute, too, which is hard. A minute is really short. Mm -hmm. And you post all that. You send it all in. And then they tell you if you're accepted or not. So it's one of those things that it comes up every so often. I would strongly encourage everyone to apply. A lot of times it takes, like, three or four applications before you get accepted. So don't be discouraged, because there's thousands of people applying, and they usually only take 50 at a time. So usually it's, it's very competitive, but it is just so exciting. They take um, a larger majority, not a complete majority, of the teachers that live in that area of wherever um, the Google or, I guess in this case, the Yahoo um, academy is going to take place, and I think it is. You know, they say that. Uh, um, yeah, that's what I heard. They, they, I have read mm -hmm. that, but like the one I went to was in Seattle, and there was one person who lived in all of Washington State. Really? So I don't know if they just didn't have a big Washington. Yeah, there, I don't know if they had a big Wash. Not a lot from Washington applied, or just I don't know. So I don't. I do think it's more based on kind of the merit of your application. 
um, my feeling, and they didn't say this, but it was such a diverse crowd as I do think they're not going to want like all fifth grade teachers. You know, I do think they want a big spread because the one I was at was everything from I think first grade through high school. You know, there was like an art teacher there. There were several administrators there, so I, it did feel like a really diverse mix. I think they're looking for everything. I don't know about the Canada. I think sometimes they do accept some from Canada. Um, but I do know. Oh, they definitely yeah. do. The one I was at, there were there were several Canadian teachers there. Yeah, and I think they're having some up in Canada. They're spreading out. Yeah, there's some in London. Um, it used to be just strictly U.S. based, but they are expanding. So um, I do encourage. Right, and they, yeah, they had one in London. They've had one in Australia. Um, they had one. I want to say maybe Thailand or something. I mean, it was something like, I can't remember exactly, but, um, or no, they had one in Israel recently within the past year. So they they really are um, getting out everywhere. They, I mean, still primarily in the United States, but they're they're really broadening our horizons for sure. Well, and yep, there was, someone just posted, there was one in New York City just this past week. Um, but they did, I think they just opened the application for another one, and it's going to be in December in, California. Right. So if you search for Google Certified Teacher Application. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. I saw that one. I thought about that. I've been thinking about that one. I say go for it. I don't I mean it was just one of those life changing experiences where you meet amazing educators. That's what I totally it hear. Just, it's incredible. Absolutely. Anyway, we want to be mindful of the time. The hour has come to a close and we are so excited to to hear all of the things that that you have done. Um, we appreciate you sharing them with us. We want to let you know that Steve Hargadon, yes, it is highly competitive. Steve Hargadon is going to be interviewing Kirsten, I'm sorry, my puppy came up here, Kirsten Olson on October the 9th and Blake Bowles on October the 11th. Denise Pope on October the 16th, Susie Boss on October the 23rd, and Jamie McMillan on October the 25th. And check those out. Those are going to be some great interview sessions with Steve Hargadon. You won't be disappointed um, when you attend his session. And on October 13th, we're going to have a K-12 warm-up session. And then on October the 20th, we will not have a show so that everybody can attend the Dan Fall Virtual Conference. And then we have some great things that we're planning after that. And we want to let everybody know that on Wednesday the 10th, October the 10th, uh, Laura Candler is going to be back with us and she's going to be talking about five amazing web tools for classroom collaboration. Kim, I'd love to jump in there and, and tell people Absolutely. a little bit more about that one. Um, Laura, has, we've been co-sponsoring Laura's uh, webinars on our Classroom 2.0 live um, site and this particular site I'm so excited about because we have a couple of our, our regular people that are going to be presenting in this webinar and Paula Nagel is one of them um, and she's going to be sharing, what they're sharing are a number of tools and in each case they're going to introduce the tool and then talk all about how they use it in the classroom. So the tools that are being shared are Animoto, Live Binders, Skype, Kid Blogs, and Class Dojo. So be, it's all free. Be sure to go to the link that's in the Live Binder to sign up. You do have to register because that's how you'll get the link to participate. And do it, log in early because her sessions often have two to three hundred people in them. So you want to make sure that you can get in. So that's Wednesday, October 10th, 8 o'clock Eastern Time. And Paula and Jan Wells are the Skype gurus, so definitely join Laura um, and her guests for a fantastic session. And if you'd like to nominate a teacher or an educator that maybe just works with colleagues, we do hope that you will do so. 
uh, there's a form that's in the live finder or you can put their name and their information on the survey today and as soon as you exit the session you don't need to do anything it will automatically open in your browser for you and you can put in feedback today as well as topics and future guests you'd like to see in future sessions and if you'd like a professional development certificate today you can type in your name and address if you watch a recording you can also request that at any time just type in that URL and if you forget you can always go to the live binder and um, request and do that as well at the, at the survey link and request another certificate for that video that, that you watched from one of the archived sessions. And then we also have an iTunes uh, link that channel that you can subscribe the MP4s or the MP3s. Uh, and we hope that you'll do that. You can take us with you. And that link is also in the is always in the archives as well as in the live binders link and it's in the chat. You can just click on it and it takes you directly into iTunes View to our channel and then you can subscribe from there. If you'd rather, you can also use an RSS feed aggregator and get the different links than the, the um, live binders link. You can use either one or both. Um, and you can take us with you wherever you go. Either way that works for you. Um, those are our archives. You can always go to our website and get that information at live.classroom20.com at any time that you uh, want information about our past shows. And we want to extend a very special thanks to Kara Mensing and to Steve Hargadon and to Weebly for the website and to each of you for sharing today and contributing to the conversation with Karen today and to Blackboard for allowing us to meet each and every week in this forum. And we are so thankful that we have uh, this opportunity to meet and we are so pleased that uh, you've joined us today and taking time from your Saturday and your weekend. So have a great Saturday. We're going to be talking about some great things next uh, Saturday. And we appreciate your time. So take care. See you online. Um, and have a great day.